Welcome to chapter two. In this chapter, we are going to be seeing several different distinct topics. And the most important and most extensive of the parts of chapter two is section 2.1 called The Sky Above. And we are in fact going to have two separate lecture videos in this format to cover this one single section of the chapter. In a lot of ways, many students find this section to be one of the most difficult that we cover all semester because it involves visualizing a lot of kind of three-dimensional motions in a way that we haven't necessarily paid attention to the sky um, to this extent in our lives. Now, there are a lot of different key learning objectives in section 2.1. These come out of the textbook, OpenStax Astronomy. But one of the key things that we want to understand is that there are going to be a lot of terms that come up in this chapter. We need to understand what those terms mean, not because we are memorizing definitions for the sake of it, because I never want us to have to memorize things just because we're supposed to, but because we need those terms in our vocabulary in order to have a wider discussion and build critical thinking skills around these topics. So in the same way that you understand most of the words um, that I'm saying in these lecture videos, we need to add some new astronomy terms to our vocabulary, and this section has quite a number of them. Out of the two different videos that we have for this section, most of the vocabulary shows up in the first video, and most of the critical thinking shows up in the second video. That way we have a chance to kind of ruminate um, in between videos if we're watching these on our own, um, at our own pace. Okay. So let's start by thinking about the term constellation. Now, every single culture around the entire globe had their own stories about the night sky, their own patterns that they saw in the stars and how they saw those patterns fitting together. And although most of the shapes and stories that we may be familiar with and that we will become familiar with um, throughout our discussion of constellations come from ancient Greece, those are not the oldest constellations that um, are known to history. The ancient Egyptians actually have the oldest recorded constellations, and they used it to help measure the passage of time. Now, when we look up in the nighttime sky, we don't get to see these beautiful pictures and um, interesting figures in the night sky. We see a bunch of dots. And a lot of times, the way that we try to understand and learn these different constellations is by making connect the dot patterns to see those different shapes. But it is really important that we understand that in the modern definition of constellation, it is not even just the connect the dot pattern. It is the entire sector of the sky um, that gets the name of that constellation. We can kind of think of this um, like states in the United States. There are all of these different borders between states. Michigan has this weird, you know, um, two-hand shape to it. And we know that not every single patch of a given state is equally as populated. There are cities that have significantly more people. In these constellations, we should be thinking about them as portions of the sky, each having their own name, and there are only certain places in that constellation that have really bright objects, like the populous cities within a state. That's where we see those stars. But we do need to recognize that the entire pattern, and they have all of these weird shapes because we tried to match them to the ancient Greek stories um, of before. But in 1928, when the International Astronomical Union sat down and took the entire sphere of the sky, every direction we can look um, in all spots, and we broke it up into 88 different constellations. 48 of those are ancient in origin. Those tend to be locations on the sky that had several bright stars, enough to make a clear pattern and to make a story about. Like Orion, um, like uh, Andromeda, Pegasus, Cassiopeia. And then there are other locations um, where we basically had to fill in smaller um, areas that didn't have very many bright stars. 
And so there's 40 additional, usually smaller constellations that we had to create in 1928. And that's how we get constellations like Telescopium and Microscopium. So for example, on this picture itself, um, one of the constellations that I like best, um, because you can see it all year round, and we'll be talking about how that changes throughout the year, is this little W shape um, that my cursor is on right now. That is the constellation Cassiopeia. And again, we need to remember that this entire jagged outline is the constellation of Cassiopeia, but there really is only a set of five stars that under decent but not great light conditions at night that you can actually see. So for example, I live within the city limits, limits of Grand Rapids. I can only see these five stars when I look in that general part of the sky. Everything else is too dim to be able to um, make it through the light pollution. Topics that we'll be talking about in chapter six. So as we consider these constellations as the full sector, like a state in um, a map, we need to recognize that there are smaller portions of constellations that are more well known. Um, patterns that many different people can see and recognize, even if they've never taken an astronomy class. So for example, can you identify a common set of stars in the constellation shown here? This is Ursa Major, also known as the Great Bear. You can pause uh, as long as you need to, and there are a lot of different stars plotted here. But I want to see if you either know it because of the name of the constellation or recognize it when you start to look for those bigger stars. All right, uh, help us out. If we look at this um, connect the dots kind of shape, we see the full great bear with far too long a tail uh, to be a standard bear, but that's fine. Um, but we see the Big Dipper. Seven stars out of the entire constellation are brighter than the rest. And so they form a pattern that is much more well known. The Big Dipper has um, meaning all throughout history, um, and it is a commonly identified subset of stars. That has a term that we need to know, and it's a term that we may not have ever heard before, and so we definitely should take note of it very carefully. An asterism is a subset of stars that form a widely recognized shape. The Big Dipper is probably the best example. The Little Dipper is another example. The Little Dipper is a subset of um, Ursa Minor. The Great Square of Pegasus is actually a fabulous example. I'm going to go back one slide to show us the picture. But this big square here that my cursor is now showing us is a great example of an asterism because only three of these four stars are actually in the constellation of Pegasus. The fourth is in the constellation of Andromeda. And so not only is, a, um, is an asterism a subset of stars, it doesn't even need to be a subset within a single constellation. It's just the fact that it is a really well-known, simple pattern that we use to kind of navigate the night sky. The Summer Triangle is another example, and Orion's Belt is probably the single most well-known outside of the Big Dippers. Orion's Belt is not the entire constellation. First of all, we know that because the constellation is the whole sector, but even the bright stars that are easily visible, Orion's Belt is not the only set of stars that you can see even in downtown um, Grand Rapids or downtown cities. There are tends to be six or seven stars within the constellation that are easily visible, including Betelgeuse, shown here in the upper left that's kind of orangish in color, and Rigel, shown in the bottom right, that has a bluer tint to it. Orion's belt is an example of an asterism, and Orion would be an example of the full constellation. So those two terms are important to us, uh, and if you need to, you can always rewatch this video if you're getting confused by them. Now, the other key thing that we want to talk about in this first of our two videos for section 2.1 are the terms that we're going to be using in what's called the celestial sphere. When we think about the nighttime sky, there are stars wherever we look, and we tend to kind of go outside, see that there are stars, 
and then go about doing something else. What we don't notice, but is able to be noticed, is that those stars move through the sky over the course of one night. They are not physically moving every night. The Earth is rotating, but they do actually move from our point of view in the same way that the sun rises and sets every single day. It is not physically moving that quickly through our sky, but it appears to, and we can talk about the fact that the sun moves through the sky because that's what it does appear to do from our perspective. We are going to build what's called the celestial sphere model, which pretends that we are fully stationary and that we are letting all of these different stars rotate around our view. The terms that we are going to need to have in our vocabulary are listed on this slide here. The next two slides are going to go through the definitions of the first six. The last uh, term here, the ecliptic, we're actually going to first talk about in that second example. It's a little bit more difficult to talk through. So let's start with the first three. Those first three terms are based on a single observer and what they are able to see around them. The horizon is a term that we use in everyday language at roughly the same um, definition that astronomy does. The horizon is where the dome of the sky meets the ground. It cuts off our field of view of anything below the horizon. If something is below the horizon, we cannot see it. And if it's above the horizon, then we can see it. So wherever we are standing, we can see in all directions around us. And even though there may be buildings or trees or hills in our way, we are gonna pretend the horizon just kind of extends flat in all directions. Zenith is the point directly over our head. Right now, even if there's someone in the room with you, I just want you to point straight up overhead at your zenith and look up at it. There's probably a ceiling. Maybe you're watching this outside. That would be great. I would like to be outside right now. But directly overhead is our zenith. I am pointing at my ceiling. You are pointing at your ceiling. We are not pointing at the same place. And so when we talk about something being at an observer's zenith, that will be based on where the observer is located. And that's why we talk about these as observer-centered terms. And the nadir is directly below our feet, so we can point directly down as well, and we recognize that although there are stars in that direction, we cannot see them. And so the nadir is not nearly as important to us, and we probably won't really see that term again after this section. So it's not worth uh, so much focus as zenith is, which is extremely important to us. But it introduces the idea that when we are trying to talk about general directions on the sky, we are going to have six total ways to talk about direction. We can talk about north, east, south, and west, and we can talk about up and down. Those are different directions than the way that a compass can point. And so we have a new special word for up, zenith and a new special word for down, nadir. So keep those in mind as we are talking about where to find things on the sky. The next three terms are fixed points in space. What that means is they are the same no matter where you're standing on the Earth. If an object is at or along the celestial equator, that's true for everybody no matter who's looking at it, no matter where we're looking. And the celestial equator is kind of straightforward. It's just the Earth's equator projected out into space. So imagine if we lined up a whole bunch of different lasers and we all shone them out into the sky, they would highlight for us where the celestial equator is. There's not a physical thing out in space that we can point at, but in the same way that the Earth's equator is just a way for us to describe locations on the Earth, the celestial equator is a way for us to describe locations on the sky. The North Celestial Pole, same kind of idea. It's just the Earth's North Pole projected out into space. We go visit the North Pole. We say hello to Santa. We set up a giant laser beam pointing directly out from the North Pole, and it will highlight for us where the North Celestial Pole sky point is. And then the South Celestial Pole, same thing. That's less true for us in the Northern Hemisphere, but just as important to people in the Southern Hemisphere. 
If we went to the South Pole, said hello to the penguins, and we took a giant laser beam and sent it out into space, it would highlight for us the South Celestial Pole as a sky point. Now, in the celestial sphere model, it is really important that we understand something key to this model, this simplified model. We are pretending in this model that the Earth is stationary and that all of the stars rotate through our sky over the course of 24 hours. If we had a camera take a long exposure picture, we would actually see these motions. And so I don't want us to think about that we're just lying about how stars work. They do physically move through our sky from our perspective. But the key astronomy thing to be aware of as we talk about this simple model is that the only reason that the stars move and that the sun rises and sets each day is because the Earth is rotating on its axis. As the Earth rotates and stuff comes into and out of view, it appears to move through our sky. Um, looking up images of star trails is a great way to see some of these motions. This article um, is one that I found has a lot of really good, um, not just images, but also diagrams and explanations. It's aimed at people who are interested in taking these star trail pictures, like the one on this slide here. So this is an example of star trails. It's from the Astronomy Picture of the Day website, and it's taken in Hawaii. So it's in the Northern Hemisphere, and we want to see that if we think about what this picture is trying to tell us, it is representing stars motion over the course of several hours on a single night. Each long line here is a single star, where it started, where it was at all of those points in between, and where it ended for the frame of time that the astronomer took the picture. Now I want you to think about something important here. What object is at the center of all of those circle motions? Pause the video if you need to to think about it. Okay, so this is a big um, test for us to see if we're starting to process these um, terms. And this is where we're gonna, um, I'll answer the question. This is where we're gonna stop this first video so that if we feel like we really are struggling with all these terms, we have time to kind of process them, reread the book if we need to, before we add new understanding um, to this. At the center of all of these, and I'm gonna use my cursor for this, this smallest and yet fairly bright arc here, that is a star, and that is the North Star. So if you said the North Star, excellent work. If not, not a problem. We're adding our, to our understanding as we go. But we see that even the North Star isn't perfectly lined up here. At the very center of all of this, where the cursor actually is um, now on the slide, that very center point is the North Celestial Pole. Because this picture was taken in the Northern Hemisphere, we are able to see if we were to shine that laser beam, we hang out with Santa, we shine that laser beam to point at the North Celestial Pole, it would be right in the middle of all of these circle points. And what we're seeing is stars that are rising in the east, and then they're going up and around, usually high into the southern sky, and then back down again. And then they set in the west, or they don't set at all. All of these ideas we're going to be building on in the second lecture video and activities that come after the lecture videos. So the object, the center of all of these motions, that brightest, shortest arc is the North Star, Polaris. And the invisible sky point at the very, very center is the North Celestial Pole. So we will pick back up here in the second lecture video for this particular section. I will see you then.